Let's pray together. Lord, I pray for the spirit of revelation. I ask that we would see and hear what we have not heard before. And Lord, I pray that we would be encouraged and strengthened. Lord, I ask for strength from heaven. Lord, I ask for for strength from heaven, God. I pray that the Holy Spirit who strengthened Gideon and said you're a mighty warrior, God, I pray that Holy Spirit would strengthen our hearts. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Amen. So we're going to continue today in our series, Last Days, and then we're going to stop and pause, and then we're going to start a shorter series on uh, the Christmas season entitled, Jesus is King. And so um, next Sunday, we will begin that series. I'm excited about the Lord who is King and His kingdom, and we'll be We'll be talking about the kingdom of the Lord. By the way, we are meeting on Christmas Eve this year. If you don't have a place to come, come. It's going to be wonderful. Christmas Eve Sunday, we'll be here. And then New Year's Eve Sunday, we're going to have a special word. And I think I already know what the Lord's given me something. And I think it's going to be beautiful. God willing, we're going to have communion on the last day of the year here. Um, and it's going to be wonderful. So if, you can, if you're here, if you're not traveling... Come, it's going to be wonderful. Um, but our foundational verse in last days is this verse in Matthew, Matthew 24, 44, where the Lord says, Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The Son of Man is one of the Lord Jesus' favorite titles for himself. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, last Sunday we started in, in Luke 21, the, chapter 21. This Sunday we're going we're gonna to in that chapter, and finish Luke 21. And I want to talk about four things um, in, in this, uh, this message. The first is the signs before the Son of Man coming in the clouds. The signs before the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Secondly, what Jesus called the fig tree parable. The fig tree parable. Third, the Lord's instructions for us to watch yourself... Stay awake and pray. And the fourth thing, we're going to cheat and go to the Gospel of Matthew because it's the same discussion. Um, And Matthew records the Lord Jesus continuing to speak and encouraging us, in my words, I'll show you when we get there, to keep loving people. Keep loving people. So with that... um, Let's go to Luke chapter 21, verses 25. So we're going to go from 25 to the end of the chapter. Um, And this is, I told you last Sunday, this is called the Olivet Discourse. Um, Again, theologians like to make up new words to sound trendy. The Lord Jesus was speaking on the Mount of Olives. And so if he spoke on the Mount of Olives, we'll call it the Olivet Talk or the Olivet Discord. That's all it is. So it's the time when the Lord spoke on the Mount of Olives. He was speaking to the boys. Um, You'll recall the very beginning that that Peter and Andrew and James and John, two sets of brothers, were with the Lord Jesus. They were looking at the temple. The temple was awesome. Y'all, listen to this. I heard this 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 week. It's amazing. Um, I heard a man preach this. It's in Josephus. I haven't found it on Josephus. Josephus is a historian, but check this out. On the wall, one of the walls of the temple was a golden vine. Imagine this, golden vine, get this, and a grape on the vine was larger than a man. Can you imagine what that would have looked like? A vine with, with, with leaves and, and clusters of grapes And one grape was larger than a man. I mean, enormous gold. Amazing. And and that's what the disciples said. Lord, look at all this. It's amazing. And the Lord said, not not one stone is going to be on another. And so when they got to him alone, they said, Lord, when are these things going to happen? What are the signs of these things going to happen? And in Matthew it says, what is the sign of the end of the age? And so that's what we're talking through in, in Luke. And in the last message, we talked about how that, that part of the Lord's message was that 
Jerusalem would be destroyed. The Jerusalem would be judged and the temple would be wiped out. And um, then it seemed like he shifted and, and he began to speak as if he's speaking about the distant future, our future. And, and we talked a little bit last week about how the Lord sometimes in the prophets is such a genius that the Lord could give a prophecy that was true for his day, the day that he, this prophet spoke, but is also true for a later day. It's like a, it's what I would call a double prophecy or a dual prophecy. And so I personally believe, and again, as I told you before, I'm, I'm doing my best, um, but there's some uncertainty in prophetic language. But my personal belief is the Lord was talking about two things at the same time. He was telling them that sure, and warning them about the destruction of Jerusalem because that was coming in about 45 years. At the same token, he's also warning us about the end. And so he begins with this passage in verse 25 where he says, And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. People fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the earth world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken and then he got then he goes on to say and then they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory now when these things begin to take place straighten up raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near so i want to separate those things i want to first talk about the sun and the moon the stars issue and the waves and then we're going to talk about the son of man coming and Hang with me. Then when we get through this passage, we'll get to the application to our lives now. But I want to go a little deep here. So get your thinking caps on. It's okay to think in church. Okay? So first thing I want you to see is that this idea, the Lord said there'll be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, and distress among the nations. There'll be roaring of waves. And then he says the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And and you say, what does that mean, Lord? Well, it's, it's important to know the Word of God, that, that the Scriptures did not happen in a vacuum. Jesus was actually also speaking in reference to what he had already spoken through one of his prophets, the prophet Isaiah. So run with me to Isaiah chapter 13, and let me look, look to this verse, and, and you'll see some very familiar language Isaiah the prophet is prophesying the judgment upon Babylon. Remember, Babylon um, came and took away Judah, the southern kingdom. Babylon was God's instrument to judge Judah. And so Babylon came and took away Judah into exile. That's, you know, Daniel the, Daniel the prophet was taken to Babylon. Well, the Lord then through the prophet Isaiah, even before, even before Babylon came, he prophesied and said, God is going to judge you, Babylon, for your evil. And he says it in Isaiah 13, 10, Behold, the day of the Lord comes. Well, first of all, 13 verse 1 says this, The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. So here's the word about Babylon. Verse 9, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. Talking about Babylon. Listen to the language he uses. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising. The moon will not shed its light. Again, verse 13. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. I want you to see that this, this is prophetic language that when God judges a nation... If I can say this, all hell breaks loose. The sun stops shining, the moon falls down, the stars are here, and the whole earth, is, the heavens are shaken. Well, he's not literally saying that the sun becomes dark. What he's saying is, is that for you, the nation, it's lights out. Everything you knew to be normal is not normal anymore because I'm coming to judge you, Babylon. And so now, here's the Lord saying... For Israel, in this time, 
the sun and the moon and the stars and the earth and the stress of nations and rivers and roars and the heavens will be shaken. What is the Lord Jesus saying? I think he's saying two things at the same time. I think one thing he's saying is, is that there's coming a day very soon when Jerusalem will be judged. And we talked about that last time. Remember, you're, you'll be desolate. The, the temple will be destroyed. That all the, the guilt of from Abel to Zechariah would fall upon the, on the nation of Israel because they rejected the Messiah. They knew better and they rejected the Messiah. And for 40 years, God gave them mercy, but then judgment came. So for them, it was like, Israel, what you know to be normal is not normal anymore. The sun's going to stop shining. The moon's going to fall down. This heaven's going to be shaken. You're over. That's what he's saying. But I think he's also saying, y'all, y'all, my Louisiana y'all, um, at the end of the age, before he comes back, I think this same situation will happen again. That there'll be judgment not on Israel at the end, there'll be judgment on the world at the end. And so when the, when the Lord judges the world, it will be once again the sun and the moon and the stars, the earth, distress of nations, and the powers of heavens will be shaken. But then he says this very interesting thing, y'all. It's only in Luke. Listen to again, it's verse 26. People fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the earth. And just above that, it says, on the earth, I'm sorry, verse 25, on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. Isn't that odd? Now, first of all, you kind of say, is that climate change? The roaring of the seas and the waves? I don't think so. But it could be. But here's what I think it is. And y'all, this is kind of super deep, so hang with me. And we're not going to spend much time on it. We actually sang about it. Do you remember the beginning? Holy Spirit, at the beginning, before God said, let there be light, the Spirit hovered over the waters. Over the waters. Do you know, Psalm 24 says that the earth is built upon the water. That actually the water is the foundation and the earth is built on the water. Why is that so important? Well, if you look in the scriptures, let me just give you one. I didn't give it to you at the, in the box. But listen to, to um, Isaiah 27, Isaiah chapter 27, verse 1. This idea about the roaring waters, the raging seas, is a, it is a metaphor for the evil that is in the earth. The raging waters was seen by the people of God in the Old Testament as a metaphor of we know we're surrounded by evil. We just don't know how to put our finger on it, but it seems to be in the waters, in the rivers, in the seas. And listen in Isaiah 27, verse 1. In that day, the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Who do you know to be a serpent? Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in where? The sea. Now, it's not like, oh, these are just mythology and they're thinking about the sea monsters. No, the... It was actually a, a, a metaphor and a revelation that the kingdom of darkness is like the raging sea that surrounds the earth and evil is in the raging sea. It is not by accident, y'all, that in the book of Revelations chapter 13, the beast comes out of the sea. The, the, the sea is a symbol of the kingdom of darkness, the fallen kingdom of darkness of the enemy. There's a bunch of scriptures. I'm not going to go to all of them, but they're there. But why, is, why are you saying that? What's the point? Check, check in. People fainting with fear and, and the nations in perplexity. Why? Because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. The, the nations will be perplexed because evil will roar. That the, the sea, the kingdom of darkness, will be roaring and will be um, high waves. In other words, the sea will invade our life by waves and, 
and, and evil of the sea will be more evident. It's, it's prophetic language. So, okay, what's that all about? Let me just tell you, because when you see this, it's just so beautiful. There is no accident that when the people of Israel came out of Egypt, they parted the Red Sea. See, the, the sea was a symbol of evil keeping you in bondage, and our God is God, and he parted the Red Sea, and they walked on what? Dry land. Why? Because the sea was pushed back by God's power. See, our God has power over the sea. Listen, there's no accident that the Lord Jesus, he's so, I tell you, our God, let me tell you, can I tell you this? Our God is courageous. You want to talk about courage? Our God stood before the Sanhedrin by himself. And the high priest said, are you the son of the most high? And the Lord said, I am. We're going to read that in a minute. Our God is courageous. And listen, he was in a boat and he was in the sea. And the sea got so scary bad that the fishermen, the professional fishermen said, we're going to drown. And I'm screaming, I'm sorry, but we're going to drown in the sea. And our God sleeps in the sea. He dissed the sea. He did not respect it. He didn't, he didn't give him any, any, any inch. Why? Because our God is God. And what's the story? The Lord, the Lord stood up and he said, peace. And the sea obeyed Jesus. That's not by accident. Listen, you want to talk about something really hot? It is not by accident. And Jesus walked on the raging sea. What was he telling us? I am over evil. Evil cannot stop me. Let it rage. Let it splash. Do, do all the waves. I'm not caring. I'm walking on top of the sea. So the nations are perplexed for the roaring of the sea. The sea, the evil, I mean, what, what are you talking? I'm talking about people are confused about what gender they are. Isn't it odd? I was just reading something where they did a, archaeological studies. And isn't it odd, kind of strange, that they were talking about how a disproportionate number of women died from the plague. Isn't it odd that you can tell gender by bone? I thought gender was mental. <laughs> so archaeologists determine gender by bones. But the Department of Education determines gender by what? Isn't it weird? See, it's the raging of the sea. It's the confusion of evil. And the nations are just perplexed by it. I just want you to know that our God is over the sea is over the evil. I don't mean over and since he rules it. No, I'm just talking about he's not intimidated by it. And one day the dragon in the sea will be bound with a chain and thrown in the lake of fire. Listen to this scripture. You'll remember it. It's just beautiful. In light of this, listen to this a different way now. Isaiah 43, verse 1 through 2. Beautiful, familiar scripture. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. Listen to this. When you pass through the waters. See, it's not just water. It's the evil waters. When you pass through overwhelming evil. That's what he's saying. The waters. I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. Isn't it interesting that in order for the people of God to enter the promised land, they went through a river. The river could not stop the presence of God. Do you remember what happened? They were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. The Bible says that when the priest's foot stepped into the water, the river stopped. Yea, God. When you pass through the rivers, you will not be overwhelmed. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame 
shall not consume you. There's a wonderful preacher, Sammy Rodriguez. He's a man of God. I love, he goes, he has a sermon that says, um, I may have gone through hell, but I smell like heaven. And it's that passage that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were in the fire, but when they got out, their clothes did not even smell. Let me tell you, can I just digress for a second? Um, Sammy has a wonderful revelation. I just never caught this before until I heard him preach. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace. And did you know the Bible does not say that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three Hebrew children, the Bible never says that they saw the Son of God in the fire. The Bible says that the king, the evil king, saw God in the fiery furnace. They didn't apparently see, perhaps, it just doesn't say. But his point was, it's not as important for you to see Jesus in the fire. You know he's with you. It's very important for hell to see Jesus in the fire with you. Yay, God. God bless Sammy Rodriguez. Um, so this idea of the, the, the earth is perplexed by the raging of the waters. And y'all, we're in it. Good gracious. We're in an age now where people can lose their job by actually saying something that is biologically true. It's goofy land. It's just crazy. Um, but you know what? When you pass through the waters, the waters, I'll be with you. The second thing I want to just um, talk about now is this idea, the second half of this passage, where he speaks about, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, I want to digress a minute and think about it with me. Think with me on this. In, in our culture, we have um, idioms. We have phrases that we say that when I say something, it brings a lot of baggage with it. It, it communicates. Like, for instance, if, you're, if there's any golfers in the house, if I said, he has three green jackets. If you're a golfer in the house, you know that there's a, a tournament called the Masters, and the winner gets a green jacket as their trophy. It's the only, only tournament that does that as far as I know, and so when you say he's got a green jacket or he's got three green jackets or two green jackets, I can say green jacket, and what I'm really talking about is he's an amazing golfer and he has, you know, all this stuff. So I'm, there's a lot of baggage when I say those little, little words. Um, there, we have phrases like just to say, boy, gosh, you know, he, he could win a Super Bowl. Well, if you know about football, you know that the Super Bowl is the big game of the American football season, right? So if we have these phrases that we say things and we're, we're communicating. Here's the funny one that's kind of weird, but I, I, I'll date myself a little bit. But have you ever heard the phrase, it's, in, it's about TV, it's about, it's about television movies, where it says they have jumped the shark. They really jumped the shark in this one. I don't know if you ever heard this before, but let me educate you because it's hilarious. Um, when I was younger, we used to watch a, a uh, sitcom called Happy Days. And Happy Days had this guy called the Fonz, who was a, he was a cleaned up hood, um, um, and he had a leather jacket and a white t-shirt, and apparently, I never saw the series, I never saw this particular episode, but it had gone on a long time, it was a n number of series, and in one of their episodes, the Fonz, who was kind of the hero, anti-hero, right, the Fonz was in a, uh, like a, a surfing, not a surfing, a, uh, uh, was it, he was some, something where he was skiing, skiing comp competition, and um, to win the competition, he jumped with his skis and jumped over sharks that were in the water during the skiing competition, and that became a euphemism that, that was so unbelievably stupid for someone to be in a skiing competition and jump over sharks in the water, that they jump the sharks. And so now, if you ever hear the phrase, it's usually in some kind of movie, it's like, they just, they just jumped the shark. And the point is, is that it, they've lost all creativity, they've totally lost their way, and now they're doing the silliest, stupid things in 
the series or whatever. Um, so anyway, I taught you something. If you think if you ever, you'll come across the phrase "jump the shark." That's what it means. It's like these guys are lame. So the idea, though, in our culture, we have phrases that when you say something, it's not really what you're saying. It's more to it than what just the words. So this is this is the phrase I want to introduce you to is this idea of the Son of Man coming in a cloud. That is a term of art, as I would say in, in my world as a lawyer. That's, a term, that's like a defined term. That means something in the Old Testament. And I want you to, to be aware of it. The first thing I want you to know is, is that in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures, only Yahweh, only the Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, rides on clouds. That's the first thing you need to know. Listen to Psalm 104. Psalm 104, verse 1. And, and, and by the way, in your Bible, if you ever see the word LORD in all caps, that means in the actual Hebrew, it's the word Yahweh. It's, it's the Lord's name. If it's, if it's not in all caps, it's probably the word Adonai, LORD. But if it's all caps, it means it's actually his, his secret name, Yahweh. And he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. The Lord rides on the clouds. He's the only cloud rider, the Lord. Now, Check this out in Isaiah chapter 19. Isaiah, once again, is prophesying. Remember, before we talked about Isaiah speaking against Babylon, here's Isaiah speaking against Egypt. And look at the language that Isaiah uses. He says, Isaiah chapter 19, verse 1, an oracle concerning Egypt. Behold the Lord, all caps, Yahweh. The Lord is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence. The heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. He's saying, the Lord is riding on a cloud and he's coming to judge Egypt. Pretty hot. Now, let me just stop and tell you this. As far as we know, the Egyptians did not see the Lord riding on a cloud. The Egyptians saw the war that defeated them. And the prophet was saying, the enemy that is destroying Egypt in battle is actually the Lord riding on the clouds bringing judgment to you. Do you see that? So it was a spiritual riding. It wasn't visible with the eyes, but it manifested in the destruction of Egypt. Okay, so you need to be thinking like a prophet. This is the word of God coming to us in Isaiah chapter 19. Okay, now then here's the, this is the definition. This is the great story. This is one of the, this is one of the top, <laughs> top 10 verses in the Bible. There's so many great verses. But it's in Daniel. Daniel had a vision, Daniel chapter 7. And Daniel said, as I looked, it's verse 9, Daniel 7. As I looked, thrones were placed and the ancient of days took his seat. So he saw someone, his name was called the Ancient of Days. His hair was white as wool, that, that, oh, his clothing was white as wool, his hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. His throne was like a chariot, his throne had wheels. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. Thousands and thousands served him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. A court sat in judgment. The books were open. So Daniel saw the Ancient of Days sitting on a fiery throne, his hair like wool, clothes white. Looks a lot like the one that John saw in Revelation when he turned and saw Jesus with his hair like white hair. But anyway... Um, but it's the Ancient of Days sitting on the throne, fire going before him, and it's a time of judgment. He's, he's coming to judge. He's the judge at that point. And then Daniel keeps looking, and he sees another 
vision of something coming to the Ancient of Days. Look, it's in verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven. Stop right there. Time out. The only cloud rider is Yahweh. We just see Yahweh, the Ancient of Days, sitting on a fiery throne, and yet here's someone else coming, riding on the clouds. And there came one, behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. A man is riding on the clouds. Yea, God. He came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So can you see it? The Ancient of Days sitting on his throne, one like the Son of Man coming, riding on the clouds. He's coming to the Ancient of Days, presenting to the Ancient of Days. Verse 14, and to him was given three things, dominion and a glory and a kingdom. Do you know, what, you know where we get that? You remember the Lord's Prayer? For thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, thine is the glory. Where do we get that? Daniel 7. Jesus received dominion, power, and glory over all peoples, not just Jews, all peoples, nations, and languages to serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Jesus is that son of man. He received, and that's where Paul got the revelation when he said that, you're, that you had the same mindset of Jesus who, who humbled himself even to the death of the cross, wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Where did he get that? Daniel 7. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Why? Because he has dominion over all peoples. So good. He is the Son of Man. Hang with me, I'll get you there. We're in Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark. This is that bold Jesus. Bold Jesus. He's at the trial. It's a mock trial, but he's at a night trial. A night, a trial by night. They're, they're, they're fearful, but they're at night. And the high priest, in verse 60, Mark chapter 14, verse 60, says, stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is this that these men testify against you? They were, the scripture says that the men were, they got false witnesses to testify and they, wouldn't, they couldn't even agree with each other. Any good judge would say that you're not a valid witness because you don't even, you don't, you don't even have your story straight. But so the high priest, realizing that, rut row, my trial is falling apart, I got to get involved. So he stands up and says, do you have an answer for this? And the Lord was silent because it was obvious that they were bogus. And so the high priest took it into his own hands, and, he, and, he, and in verse 621, the high priest said, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? You know, if you, sometimes people will say this, and they're just, they don't know the Bible. They'll say, you know, Jesus never claimed to be God. Read the scriptures. Verse 62, Jesus said, I am. Pretty clear. And then he said this, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. They all do what he said. I am the Son of Man. I'm the one that's taking it all from the ancient of days. And you'll, you'll see me. And the high priest tore his garments. Let me just digress here because I think this is super hot. Listen, there's only one time in history that we know of where the high priest on earth met the high priest in heaven. The high priest on earth is the high priest of Israel. He didn't know it, but he was standing before the high priest after the order of Melchizedek in his presence. And he didn't even know what he was doing. He thought he was tearing his garments out of blasphemy because he's heard blasphemy. I believe it's just the humor and the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit said, you are in the presence of the high priest, resign. And he, and he tore his garments. So hot. I love that. And he says, what further witnesses do we have? They took him away, and we know that he rose from the dead. But I want you to see... 
getting back now to this scripture, because I, I, I wanted to lay that foundation, because here's what I think. Y'all, this is, this is a little deep. Hang with me, and you don't have to, you don't have to agree with me. It's okay. But um, I believe that it is very possible when the Lord said, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and glory. I'm back at Luke 21. I believe that's a dual passage. I believe that the Lord intended, because he said to the high priest, you will see me coming on the clouds. Now, first you need to see, coming on the clouds, where was the Son of Man going when he was on the clouds? Can I tell you, he wasn't going to earth. He was going to the Ancient of Days. Right? You with me? Coming, coming was coming to the Ancient of Days, not coming to Jerusalem. So what I think the Lord Jesus was saying, because I think it's both. Y'all, I'm not, trying to, I'm, not, I'm not trying to take away the second coming, where I preach about the second coming. I believe in the second coming. I believe what the Lord was saying is, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, when you see Jerusalem destroyed, that will be the sign to you that I am the Son of Man and I have come to the Ancient of Days and I have received power, glory, and dominion. You're, you're supposed to see that. Now, if you don't have eyes to see, that's your problem. But you will see me there. You. You. Talking to you, Caiaphas, right? I just believe that that was part of it. Now, but I don't believe that's the full fulfillment because I believe we will actually see the Lord coming on the clouds. And part of, my, part of that, we talked about that last time, remember, in Acts chapter 1, the angel said the way he left is the way he's coming back. And they saw him leave. It wasn't a spiritual leaving. So it's, it's, it's not going it's, it's to be a spiritual coming. So the point is, sometimes the Lord can come in judgment and you don't see him. That's Isaiah chapter 19, when he came to Egypt. You with me? You follow with me? You can, the Lord can come in judgment, riding on the clouds, and it's, you don't see him personally. You just see the armies that wipe you out. Right? But then there's a day when the Lord actually will come in the clouds and you will see him. So it's, it's a little complicated, but the Lord's that, he's a genius. That's what he does. So I want you to see that he said, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And then he said, he said this, he said, now when you see these things, straighten up, your redemption is drawing nigh. So what does that mean? Well, I think it's a, it's a twofer, y'all. On one hand, for the, the early church, if you can handle this, it was a bit of a rescue for the early church for Jerusalem to be destroyed because for the early church, the apparatus of, of Jerusalem was actually the number one um, persecutor of the church. Remember, Saul was sent from Jerusalem. So to a certain extent, if you, look, go, if you go read in Thessalonians, it talks about how that the, the Jewish people who were resisting the gospel were actually building up for themselves wrath to come. In other words, that, that they shouldn't be messing with the Lord, right? So there's one aspect that it was redemption for the people living at that time. But the bigger issue is for us at the end of the age. When we see him coming in the clouds, your redemption is here. Lift up. He's rescuing you. So I want you to see this. It's, it's a kind of a double thing there. And I know it's a little hard maybe to keep it in mind, but it's, it's beautiful because right now the Lord Jesus has received the kingdom, the glory, and the dominion. And he sits at the right hand of the Father. So now I want you to, to move on to the fig tree parable. The Lord said in verse 29, he told them a parable, said, Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they come out in leaf, you see for yourselves and know the summer's already near. So also when you see these things take place, you know the kingdom of God is near. And he says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will not pass away. I, I you know, the Lord said, when you see the signs of the times, just like you look at a, a tree, when the leaves start coming on the tree, you know there's probably fruit there. In the same token, when you see the stars falling and the moon, you know, when you see catastrophic judgment 
on a nation for the purpose of Jerusalem or the world. When you see just this climate, be aware that it's a season. The fruit's coming. Judgment is coming. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's the idea of being mindful of the fig tree, the blossoming of leaves. And, and he says here, he says, this generation won't pass away until all has taken place. The only way I can understand it for me is that he was primarily speaking in that passage about Jerusalem because in 40 years, Jerusalem was, was destroyed. The temple was judged and, and, uh, and judged. And, and then because obviously we're the second half of the parable or second half of the prophecy, we're still here and it's, it's coming upon us at some point. So then I want to I move on to some application the Lord gave us. In verse 34, in light of all this, the Lord Jesus says, first, watch. And then he says, stay awake. But I want you to see that the first thing is kind of counterintuitive. The first thing he says is, watch yourselves. So don't pay attention to the signs of the times. The first thing he tells us to do is, Watch yourselves. Watch you. Well, well, sir, what do I need to watch about me? He says, lest your hearts will be weighed down with three things. Dissipation. I had to look that up. It, 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 one definition in the, in, the, in the Greek is actually like drunken nausea. I think it's like a hangover. It's like you're just bad headache, can't move. It hurts to walk. Dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this life and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. The first thing he tells us is there is going to be a temptation for your hearts to be so weighed down with what? With all hell breaking loose in the earth. You're going to be, there's going to be a temptation for you to be depressed because people can't figure out what gender they are. And this isn't the world I used to live in. And this is the, there's just so evil in the world and people are invading the people and people are killing people. And, and the senselessness and the overwhelming evil will tempt us to self-medicate. You'll get drunk. Whether it's drunk by getting drunk at your job. I'm not talking about alcohol. I'm just talking about drunk, drunkenness is, is drink, doing something that's legal over, over, over too much. And it causes harm. Right? Because it was legal to drink alcohol. It was, it was, it was not, uh, drinking alcohol is not unholy. The Lord Jesus drank alcohol. So you, obviously you can drink alcohol and not sin because the Lord never sinned. So it's not, it, it's not alcohol. He's not preaching against alcohol. He's preaching out against drunkenness, about medicating yourself with taking the boat out every weekend because i got to forget how weird things are. What's your drunkenness? Is it the boat? Is it golf? Is it, is it shopping? Is it, is it binge Netflix? You know, what is your drunkenness? He says, don't self-medicate. Don't. Don't turn to seeking to self-medicate and not being able to handle, because it is a burden, y'all. It is an overwhelmingness. And, and you could just go, what's the use? It's just, I'm just going to delve into whatever it is that self-medicates. Drunkenness, so much so that I get nauseous, you know, whatever. Or the cares of this life. Just, okay, I'm just, I'm just going to delve into trying to figure things out. That's not, that's not the source of our life either. He said, watch yourself in the, in the midst of terror, in the midst of craziness, in the midst of evil like we've never seen before. And y'all, it's going to get worse. It doesn't take much to figure out. It's going to get worse. Evil will continue to become evil. When restraint, the more restraints are taken off, the more evil will happen. And he says, watch yourself. Don't seek to, to get comfort from your heart in drunkenness 
or in the cares of this life. Do you remember cares of this life? That, that, in Mark, remember? Remember the parable of the sower and the seeds? Yeah. What choked the word? The deceitfulness of riches, the desire for other things, the, the cares of this life. See, we could, we, we could be so overwhelmed by what's the use that we turn to drunkenness. And again, I'm not talking about alcohol. It could be, but it's really, I, it turned to overdoing something to deaden the pain, to deaden, to, to change my mind. I don't want to think about it anymore. I just want to go on the boat. I want to go fishing. I want to go whatever. I like to fish. I like to hunt. All that stuff. I'm not saying that. You see what I'm saying? Don't get drunk. Be moderate in your life. And here's the thing. Where then do we go when our heart is overwhelmed? Y'all, we need to press into Jesus. Amen. Jesus is able to alleviate and to give strength to our heart. Exactly what Jeff said. The joy of the Lord is our strength. His, his presence is what will help us get through this. And don't look for a substitute presence. Don't look for a substitute presence. Don't get drunk. Don't go for the cares of this life. It can be, the day will be a trap to you. Instead, press into the Lord. Say, Lord, I am overwhelmed. I am confused. I'm perplexed. It's just weird. Lord, the people are insane. How do I get through this? What do I do? And the Lord says, he says, look, come to me. Press into me. And he will give us life and light and strength where this stuff won't give us strength. Netflix, binge walking, watching Netflix will not strengthen your soul. I know we know that. And, I, and you know, we play in that because that's okay. But I'm talking about the Lord said, watch yourself. This is the Lord speaking. Watch yourself. Don't let this happen to you. Second thing he said was, look, it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the earth. Next thing he said was, stay awake. Stay awake. Well, I think that's just another kind of a symptom of, I don't know about y'all. I, I don't know. It's not therapy. I shouldn't do too much of this. But um, sometimes when I'm depressed, I just want to sleep. Did you ever get, maybe I'm the only, it'd be my therapy session. Thank you. Don't bill me too much. I'll just confess. But you know what I'm saying? Sometimes you're just like, when, it's, when, I, when my heart is overwhelmed, I'm not like, lead me to the rock. I'm like, lead me to my bed. Let me take a nap. Right? Let me just hide. Right? You know, that, that idea, you know? So that idea is stay awake. Don't let depression get you down and, and, and be alert. Be alert. I think that's the idea of being alert with what's going on. I think that's so important. Um, Stay awake at all times. Um, be alert to know what's happening. Um, and then he says to pray that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place. He says to pray for strength. Pray for strength. I, um, I, I'd like to, to meditate on this and search it out more, but I, I, there was a message that Miller preached, which is the pastor of um, the underground church when we went to the pastor's conference, and the Bible says that the disciples were tired and weary because of sorrow, that sorrow had made them tired, and if you follow it through, because they were sorrowful, they were tired, because they were tired, they failed, and when they were tempted, they ran from Jesus. And so he, he, his message was that you can become sorrowful. You can, you can miss the old days. I miss it when we didn't have to worry about sending our kids to school, whether they would train them to, like, think they could become giraffes. I mean, like, w w w what's happened where you can't trust the school system to just teach reading, writing, and arithmetic, and instead we're, we're training them how to be sexual when they're in second grade. I mean, well, I mean like, see, it was that kind of stuff. It's like, and you could be weary and worried and tired and say, I just want to take a nap. I just don't want to, I just don't, I just want to check out. And the Lord said, no, stay awake. 
Stay with me, because if you're awake, Holy Spirit can use you to do what you're supposed to do in your neck of the woods, in your area. Listen, I can't save. You remember that story about the little girl or little boy, whatever, that saw a thousand starfish on the beach and she was running out or he was running out and grabbing a starfish and throwing it in the water and running and throwing it in the water and some man came up and said, what are you doing? There's like a thousand starfish. What does that matter to anybody? They picked up one starfish and said, mattered to him. Picked up another starfish. It mattered to him. It's like, how, it's so overwhelming. How can we do anything? Do what you can do. Be about the king's business. Let us do what we're to do. Let us stay awake and do what we can do, what God has placed in our hands to do. And we'll trust the other brothers and sisters who have Holy Spirit to do what they're supposed to do. And together we'll do what the king wants to do. That's what we need to be to be about his business. The last thing I want to share is to skip over to Matthew. Hang with me. Matthew, the Lord Jesus continues in the same discussion, and he says this, verse, chapter 24, verse 25, verse 45, forgive me. Who then is the faithful and wise servant who his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. I gave you a job to do. Be doing it when I come. When I was little, my dad had a grocery store. My uncle, I, was, I was, must have been little. I'm probably five or six years old. And he gave me a little feather dust, mop, dust thing. And it was a long row of cans. And our job was to dust the cans, y'all. Like, I'm talking, I'm talking about corn and black eyed peas. And they get dusty. No one wants to buy dusty because like, you'd have to do like a feather duster. And I was a little bitty kid. And, I, you know, I did it for a while. And then I, you know, went and played. And I remember, I remember my, my uncle coming to me and he said, Patna? He always called us Patna. Patna? He said, are you? I, I went and looked. I don't think you were finished. I said, well, Uncle Carol, I just got tired. He goes, well, you got to go get finished. Well, like, this is what he's saying. I put you dusting cans. Don't quit until you're done, right? Let us be about the king's business. I said it this way, keep loving people. Keep at it, y'all. Uh, but, 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 but they're saying that this and they're, they're doing that. Yeah, I get all that. They are, they are. But the king told me to do this. I'm dusting cans. I'm running my route. I'm loving people, right? Let's do what the king told us to do. I realize that the house is on fire, but when I pass through the fire, it won't burn me, so I'm going to keep dusting cans, right? So keep going. He says, he says truly, I, y'all, this is in the book. If it weren't in the book, it'd be illegal to say this. The Lord said this. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. You mean to tell me that he said that if I dust cans, he will set me over a galaxy? Uh Uh-huh. That's just the way he is. He's that good. But he keeps saying, keeps speaking, if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. My master is delayed. I, I, don't, I don't believe, personally, I don't believe this is talking about a, a believer that turns into an unbeliever. I believe, he says, it's a wicked servant. In other words, that that there are people that can act like they're microwaves, but they don't have any life in them. And so when, if he doesn't come back, we'll just rock and roll and do what we want to do. We'll abuse the people. We'll make money off the church, whatever. Or, and the Lord said, I, I am coming back, and that person will be judged. And they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so... I want to, I just remind you, did you know that 
when Moses went up to the mountain, the people said, Moses is delayed. Come make us an idol to worship. There is a, there is a temptation in the delay. The Lord's timing is not your timing. A day like the Lord is a thousand years. The Lord's timing is not our timings, and there is a temptation in the delay. And when he delays, that's why you need each other, y'all, because you need to be, have the encouragement of the saints for someone to tell you, listen, he's faithful, he's good, keep serving him, keep following him, stay awake, watch yourself. Don't turn to a stupid idol. Don't turn to a stupid golden calf, right? Don't, don't worship a lesser God. That's what they were doing. When you, when, anytime you make an idol, you by definition are limiting God because he is without limit. So the delay, the delay, the delay can tempt you. The, the, the second coming of the Lord can tempt you. Lord, I, when I was little, we talked about this, and you're still not here. And Peter said, I know there's scoffers. There are people going to say, yeah, but nothing's ever changed. But listen, they forget. God judged the earth through Noah in Noah's day. God will judge the earth again with fire. The same God that did that will do this. But a day to the Lord is like a thousand years. You need, to, you need to look at his delay in coming is evidence of his mercy because he is trying to save as many as possible. He is trying to adopt as many as he can. And because when he comes back, the adoption door is over. So, while we cry, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, at the same time we say, Lord, give us a little more time because I've got family members, I've got friends. Keep working on the people that haven't said yes yet, right? There's that tension. Lord, we, we want as many, as many as possible at the wedding, as many as possible. So, I want to encourage you, saints, watch yourself. Stay awake and pray and continue to love people. Continue to love people. Be encouraged by each other. Be encouraged by each other. And let's don't be like that stupid, silly servant that said, the Lord's delayed. I'm going to, every man for himself, every woman for himself. No, he's coming back. The king is coming back. He is coming back. Whether we see him with our eyes in the clouds or I have a personal, a personal meeting with him, we will all see the king. It's going to be good. And I, I, I want to urge every person in the house, people that are listening, listen, you want to come to him saying, Lord, I'm here not on my own performance, my own life, because my life doesn't add up. It's not clean enough for you. I'm here because you did this. I'm here because you came and died for my sins. I'm here trusting in you. Let me tell you, I'm like a gambler that's all in. I don't have any other plan. I don't have any other speech. The only plan I have, the only speech I have before the king is, I'm hoping in the blood of Jesus to take away my sins. That is my prayer. And anything less than that is not enough. It's not enough. So I urge us all, this is a good time to say yes to him. Let's pray together. Lord, I believe that you will come again. I believe you are the son of man. I believe you have received the kingdom and dominion and glory. Lord, I pray that you would save every person that hears my voice. I pray that you'd save us all, Lord. I ask for the forgiveness of Jesus to be available to everyone who believes. To everyone who believes. If you're in the house and, and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, I'm not going to embarrass you or anything. I'm just going to ask you, you can do business with the Lord right now. The Bible says if you will believe in your heart that he raised Jesus from the dead, that Jesus died for your sins and that he's alive right now, that he died for you, that you will be rescued. You'll be born again. Yay, God. 
He'll put His Holy Spirit in you. You'll be new. The Bible says you confess with your mouth. Tell somebody that you, I believed upon Jesus. I've placed my faith in Him. Place my faith. Put all my marbles. I put all my chips. I put my whole life upon trusting Jesus. I also want to just think and speak to each each person in here because we all get weary, we get tired, we get overwhelmed with just plain evil, just darkness. The Bible says that, that Lot was a righteous man and his soul was vexed by living in Sodom. He was just traumatized by Sodom. I pray that God would res- revive, restore strengthen your heart for the race that you would endure like Jeff said that you would endure strength of endurance and and I, I'm, I'm praying that the Lord would would reveal to us if we have um, medicated in areas of our life that have, are too much the Lord said don't get drunk I don't know if I'm not necessarily talking about alcohol I'm just talking about too much fill in the blank that I've Lord forgive us and and help us to rearrange our lifestyle so that we do not seek to self-medicate with whatever but instead come to the fountain of living waters come to the Lord Jesus himself come to the rock and speak to the rock and say Lord I'm overwhelmed I need help I'm overwhelmed, I need your life. I'm overwhelmed, I need your joy. Overwhelmed, I need your peace. I need your strength. I need your sanity in a world of insanity. I need your wisdom, how to navigate this insanity. I need help from heaven. That's a great prayer. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would download life and strength and encouragement to your people. Wisdom. Help us to speak wisely. Help us to be men and women of compassion and generosity and grace. to you and bring to you our burdened hearts. I pray that you would carry our burdens. We cast our cares upon you for you care for us. in the world you'll have trouble but be of good cheer I have overcome the world Lord I pray for this the spirit of Jesus the spirit of the one who overcame the world strengthen our spirits Lord. strengthen our hearts I pray for encouragement from heaven come Holy Spirit increase your presence among us Lord give us your strength your wisdom your grace Thank you, sir.